The Happiness Fantasy by Carl Cedarstrom. The Happiness Fantasy from 2018 advances a provocative thesis, encapsulated in its title. Our contemporary ideas about happiness amount to a fantasy that's increasingly out of sync with reality and unable to deliver what it promises. By taking a whirlwind tour of the history of this fantasy, we can begin to see through its illusions. Who should read this? People who are interested in the countercultural movements and philosophies of the 1960s and 1970s. People who are skeptical of self-help books and seminars. And people who are burned out by the invasion of work life into leisure time. Who wrote the book? Carl Cedarstrom is an associate professor of organization studies at the Stockholm Business School of Stockholm University. He's the co-author of Dead Man Working from 2013, The Wellness Syndrome from 2015, and Desperately Seeking Self-Improvement, A Year Inside the Optimization Movement from 2018. He has also written articles for a variety of publications, including The Guardian, The Washington Post, New Scientist, and Harvard Business Review. What's in it for me? Discover the strange origins of our current ideas about happiness. How do you achieve happiness? It's one of our most fundamental questions, something that human beings have been wrestling with for thousands of years. Along the way, we've produced innumerable answers, from the philosophical texts, religious creeds, and spiritual practices of the ancient world, to the psychological therapies, pharmaceutical products, and self-help books of today. This book will not provide you with the answer, or even an answer, to this age-old question. Instead, it constructs one of the most prevalent and pernicious answers that have taken root in the collective imagination of modern Western culture, the happiness fantasy. In these blinks, you'll learn about the dubious history, premises, and ramifications of this happiness fantasy that consists of a set of questionable ideas and ideals and creates a distorted vision of the good life, an aspirational notion of a life that's good in both senses of the term, desirable and moral. Along the way, you'll find out about an influential psychological theory, theory that placed orgasms at the pinnacle of human existence, a supposedly miraculous device that could cure all diseases and a motivational speech that began with the entire audience being called a bunch of assholes. The happiness fantasy provides people with a template for living the good life. When you create a new document in a word processor, you start with two basic options, a blank page or a template. If you choose the latter, you're furnished with a prefabricated design for the newsletter, brochure, or whatever you want to make. The general layout is already established. You just have to fill in the outlines with your particular content. Similarly, similarly, the happiness fantasy provides you with a template for living the good life. Thanks to this template, you don't have to come up with your own blueprint for constructing an enjoyable, meaningful human existence. It's already been supplied by the culture in which you've been raised, and all you have to do is follow it. The central component of the template is the concept of self-actualization. The idea here is that you have a true inner potential, a set of capabilities for thinking, feeling, desiring, and doing things. These capabilities constitute your true inner self, a sort of intangible core at the center of your personhood. Around this core, you accumulate a variety of extraneous elements in the course of living your life, misguided beliefs, unhealthy emotions, self-limiting inhibitions, and destructive patterns of behavior. As they crust over you like a shell, these elements obscure and obstruct your inner potential, leaving you with just a scab-like shell to present to the outside world. This is your inauthentic self. By shedding the shell of this inauthentic external self, reconnecting with your true inner self, and releasing the concealed capabilities lying dormant within it, you thereby actualize yourself. In other words, you turn the potentiality of your true inner self into an external reality. In doing so, you become authentic, since your outward self is now an accurate reflection, expression, and manifestation of your inward self. And 
as your no longer obstructed self comes pouring out into the world. You also experience pleasure, which is the positive sensation you feel when you exercise and gratify your inner self's capabilities and desires. So there you have it. Actualize your true inner potential. Authentically express your true inner self and seek the pleasures that come with doing so. That's the happiness fantasies template for the good life. The ideas behind the happiness fantasy have a strange origin story, which begins with Wilhelm Reich. The ideas behind the happiness fantasy came into prominence during the 1960s and 1970s in California, where they became associated with the era's countercultural movements. However, their roots can be traced back even further. To 1920s Vienna, they germinated from the rather unusual life, work, and thought of the Austrian psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich. Starting from a very early age, Reich was driven by a lifelong obsession with sexuality, which was sparked by a series of sexual experiences in his childhood. These included masturbating his younger brother's nursemaid at the age of five, eagerly eavesdropping on his mother having extramarital sex with his private teacher at the age of 10, and losing his virginity to his family's chef at the age of 11. In 1990, 19, when he was 22, Reich became the youngest member of Sigmund Freud's inner circle, Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. As a psychoanalyst, Reich's fascination with sexuality continued. He developed a psychological theory that revolved around the idea of orgastic potency, the ability to experience a full orgasm. He claimed it was the linchpin of mental health. Lacking it was the ultimate cause of all psychological disorders, and gaining it was a key to overcoming them. In the early 1930s, as Reich became increasingly fixated on orgastic potency, he found himself increasingly marginalized by the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, which began to view him as a fanatic. Ultimately, he was expelled from the society because of his hetero, heterodox views abrasive personality, which was characterized as aggressive and The trajectory of his life was then marked by a series of actions, forcing him to leave the Berlin Psychoanalytic Society, the International Psycholytic Association, and the entire countries of Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. The anti-authoritarian aspects of Wilhelm Reich's ideas resonated with mid-century Californian hipsters. A scattering of seeds does not grow into a forest overnight. They take years to develop and spread. The same is true of influential ideas and the movements into which they eventually blossom. Such was the case for Reich, whose ideas first took root in California in the late 1940s and 1950s. There, groups of young, left-wing, and anarchistic bohemians who became known as hipsters were beginning to gather. A number of signifiers marked them out from the masses of conventional society. Beards, sandals, corduroys, makeshift furniture, abstract art, and words like effective, fluid, and orgastic. If that last word reminds you of Reich, well, there's a reason for that. Like many countercultural groups before and since the hipsters had certain touchstone books that they shared, discussed, and quoted with each other. Chief among them, Function of the Orgasm, from 1927, one of Reich's seminal works. Amid all of his talk about orgastic potency, it was a deeply anti-authoritarian message that was intertwined with Reich's ideas, and it was this aspect that drew the hipsters to his thought and work. In Reich's view, family and the state were oppressive, authoritarian institutions. They limited people's freedoms by demanding obedience and encouraging them to suppress their desires. By desires, of course, largely meant yearnings for sex in general, and orgasms in particular. But his thinking here was a bit more sophisticated than just being about orgasmic sex. Basically, he thought that people's fundamental desire was to experience pleasure, which came in two forms. The first was the inauthentic, superficial, and passive pleasure of consumerism, 
particularly that of watching television and listening to the radio. In contrast, there was the authentic, deep, and active pleasure of creating, working for, and thereby earning joyful experiences. For Reich, orgasmic sex was simply the highest manifestation of such pleasurable experiences. By persuading people to suppress their sexual longings, the family and the state were therefore also persuading them to renounce their most fundamental desire for experiencing authentic pleasure. This, in turn, cemented their obedience. After all, if you can cajole people into relinquishing their most fundamental desire, it's relatively easy to convince them to give up on, say, a particular political demand. For Reich, sexual liberation and political liberation, therefore, came hand in hand, a view that deeply resonated with the hipsters and their famous progeny, the hippies. In Big Sur, California, ideas about uninhibited sexuality were fused with drug-fueled mysticism. To follow the path of Reich's ideas from the hipsters of the 1950s to the hippies of the 1960s, we first need to make a stop at writer Henry Miller's residence in scenic Big Sur, California. As the infamous author of sexually explicit novels that were banned in the United States, Miller became a countercultural icon in the 1950s. When he settled in Big Sur in 1957, his friends followed his lead, and soon the area was known as West Greenwich Village the Californian version of New York's famous epicenter of bohemian life. Besides their affinity for Henry Miller, the bohemians of Big Sur were united by their interest in banned books, anarchistic politics, and uninhibited sexuality. Meanwhile, however, Miller's views and writing on sexuality were in the process of evolving, broadening from a narrow focus on literal, physical sex to a more metaphorical, mystical form of eroticism. In this line of thought, which other bohemians would soon follow, sensual love was no longer just a matter of forging interpersonal connections through each other's bodies. Its scope had expanded to achieving a joyful sense of cosmic harmony with nature, which was often euphemism for doing drugs. In the early 1960s, the bohemians started using psychedelic substances like LSD, mescaline, and psilocybin, or psilocybin to pursue drug-induced mysticism, which was the title of one of the first seminars delivered at the Esalen Institute in 1962. Based in Big Sur, the Institute was established by Michael Murphy and Richard Price, who are recent graduates of Stanford University. In their words, they described it as an alternative educational center devoted to the exploration of the human potential. By the end of the 1960s, the Institute had exploded in popularity, going from holding four courses in 1962 to 129 courses in 1968. In that time, it became one of the main intellectual laboratories cooking up the ideas of the happiness fantasy. The list of speakers and teachers at the Institute included many of the most famous names of countercultural thought in the 1960s, such as philosopher Alan Watts, psychologists Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers, and writer Aldous Huxley. Together, they and their adherents became known as the Human Potential Movement. However, amid all of the luminaries just mentioned, the most influential member of the movement was a German-born psychiatrist, Fritz Perls, who, back in 1930s Berlin, had been a disciple of none other than Wilhelm Reich. The ideas of the ha happiness fantasy were further developed at the Esalen Institute by the psychoanalyst Fritz Perls. Before he took up a five-year residency at the Esalen Institute in 1964, Fritz Perls dressed the part of a traditional psychiatrist, wearing collared shirts and sports coats. Once he arrived in Big Sur, however, he ditched them for vibrant jumpsuits and a Santa Claus-like beard. However, Despite his radical change in appearance, his work at the Institute represented a continuation of Gestalt therapy, a Wolfgang Reich-inspired approach to psychotherapy that Pearls developed back in his more buttoned-down days. According to the theory behind Pearls' Gestalt therapy, life is like a theatrical production. Each of us is an actor with a role to play, and we have a fundamental choice to make, to live by the scripts that other people have written for us, or to take charge of our performances. 
the point of the therapy is twofold. To lead people to the realization that they've been making the first choice and to encourage them to make the second choice. Pearls referred to this process as brainwashing, by what she meant process of cleaning the mental muck from a patient's mind. That muck consisted of other people's expectations, which the patient had mentally internalized. As it encrusted itself on her mind, the muck formed a sort of psychological armor that covered up her true nature, or hidden self, stifling her inner desires in the process. At his Gestalt therapy-based workshops at the Esalen Institute, Pearls would have one participant at a time sit next to him in front of everyone, which he called sitting on the hot seat. The participant was then asked to share her dreams and act out characters on them. The more emotional the performance, the better. Screaming and crying were encouraged. By do doing this, Pearls thought, the participant would break through her psychological armor and release her true inner self. This, in turn, would lead to greater self-awareness, self-healing, and authentic self-expression. The ultimate objective was self-development another term for self-actualization, the conceptual linchpin of the happiness fantasy. Over the course of the 1960s and 1970s, many self-development training centers sprouted around the United States, and thousands of people attended them. As the training reached more and more mainstream, middle-class Americans, it became increasingly fused to more commercial overtones. This trend reaches its epogee in 1971 with the training seminars of a man named Warner Erhard, who you'll learn about in the next blink. Warner Erhard fused the ideas of the human potential movement with an emphasis on material success. The story of Warner Erhard begins with the story of John Paul Rosenberg. In 1959, at the age of 24, Rosenberg abandoned his wife and four children in Philadelphia. He then changed his name to Warner Earhart and fled to San Francisco, where he became a door-to-door -door encyclopedia salesman. In San Francisco, Earhart found a city that was becoming a hotbed of drug-fueled experimentation and spiritual exploration. Telling about these activities were the ideas of the Human Potential Movement and the Esalen Institute, where hippies saw a chance to reconnect with inner selves and achieve the happiness fantasy of authentic self-actualization. Earhart also sensed a commercial opportunity to make money off people's interest in self-development. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, Earhart dabbled with marketing Scientology training courses. Then, in 1971, he joined Holiday Magic, a pyramid sales company that offered a motivation training program called Mind Dynamics. After participating in the training himself, Earhart became one of its most popular instructors. So popular, in fact, that he decided he could be more successful if he struck out on his own. Later that same year, he founded an organization called Earhart Seminar, Seminar Training, which he preferred to abbreviate as EST. In Latin, EST means it is. The simple slogan that, in Earhart's mind, reflected the simplicity of his training program's message. He summarized that message as follows. What it is, is, and what ain't, ain't. However, despite the simplicity of Earhart's message, it derived its inspiration from a variety of sources. The first source was Fritz Perls, whose workshop methods provided a model for Earhart's training techniques. The second source was another luminary of the human potential movement, Alan Watts, who fused Western psychology with Eastern mysticism. The third source consisted of self-help books from the 1930s, such as Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, which preached that people's failure and poverty were the results of their negative beliefs about themselves. Earhart took bits and pieces from these three sources, mixed them with the training methods he learned from Scientology and mind dynamics, and fused them with his commercial instinct and emphasis on achieving material success rather than spiritual enlightenment. The results were so dramatic that they deserve a blink of their own, especially given their influence. Over the course of the 1970s and 1980s, 700,000 people attended Earhart's training programs. His challenging training courses, Warner Earhart 
Earhart preached a message of an awful self. Given Earhart's influences from the human potential movement, you might expect his est training seminars to have been hippy dippy affairs, full of peace and love. But the truth was quite the opposite. To begin with, the seminars were physically demanding. Each seminar consisted of four sessions, and each session lasted 15 to 19 hours, and participants weren't allowed to eat or get up from their chairs, even if they had to urinate. The only permitted exceptions were a few short bathroom breaks and a single meal break. The seminars were also emotionally grueling. First, there was the verbal abuse. Earhart delivered hour-long rants in which he subjected his audience to profanity-laced insults about how worthless they were as human beings and how ridiculous and deluded their beliefs about themselves and the world were. To give you a flavor of what this sounded like, here are the opening words of his welcome speech. In this you're going to find out you've been acting like ass. All your fucking cleverness and self-deception have gotten you nowhere. Then. It was extremely intense emotional experiences. For example, all 250 or so participants were instructed to lie on the floor and focus their minds on the inner demons they wanted to overcome, such as a fear or a bad memory. While facing these demons, participants began screaming, moaning, and even vomiting. While these methods were extreme, they weren't without precedent. In a way, Earhart was basically just taking the therapeutic techniques of pearls and putting them on steroids. Like pearls, Earhart saw himself as trying to help people break through the psychological armor that was holding them back. From his perspective, the verbal abuse and emotional experiences were just tools for accomplishing this. Once he'd punctured his audience's armor through methods like the ones described above, he then proceeded to give long lectures in which he elaborated the philosophy behind his version of the happiness fantasy. Beneath his audience's psychological armor, Earhart claimed, there lurked an all-powerful self, brimming with untapped potential. The limits of what that self can accomplish, he claimed, are merely the limits of our will, our ability to make and carry out decisions. We can accomplish anything if we try hard enough. Therefore, success is just a matter of effort, and anyone can succeed. That might sound like a very optimistic message, but it also has a dark side, which we'll turn to next. Earhart's messages live on today, and their logic can lead to victim blaming. If success is just a matter of effort, and anyone can accomplish anything if he tries hard enough, what does it mean if someone fails? Well, by the same logic, it means he didn't try hard enough. And that means there's no one but himself to blame for his failures. After all, thanks to his all-powerful will, he is responsible for everything that happens to him, both good and bad. From this logic, Warner Earhart drew the most extreme conclusions possible. Not only were business people responsible for their career failures, but victims of rape, murder, cancer, war, and even the Holocaust were to blame for their suffering, he claimed. While few people would go as far as Earhart did in drawing such conclusions, the underlying logic is still pretty pervasive in Western culture. Indeed, its most prominent advocate is one of the most famous and influential celebrities of the United States, the television talk show host, media empire executive, and multi-billionaire Oprah Winfrey. Through her media empire, Oprah promotes messages that bear a striking resemblance to those of Earhart. On her television show, for example, a depressed mother on welfare was encouraged to solve her problems by letting go of her victim mentality and embracing her inner power. While the intention behind this sort of message may be to empower people to feel hopeful and take charge of their lives, its underlying logic gives rise to a deeply problematic view of the world. It enables people a lack of compassion for disadvantaged members of society, and to transform social problems into personal problems. From this point of view, if people are poor, they must have gotten themselves into that predicament, and if they had just rolled up their sleeves and worked hard, themselves out of it. The parallels between Oprah's messages and those of Earhart are no coincidence. 
She is one of many A-list celebrities who has been attracted to Earhart's training programs. Other famous people who have been drawn to them include Steven Spielberg, Barbara Streisand, and Cher. Although it has changed its name from EST to Landmark Worldwide, Earhart's self-development training organization is very much alive and well. Indeed, for more than three decades now, its programs have been, and continue to be, very popular with a number of major corporations, which is a story we'll turn to now. By the 1980s, the human potential movement's radical politics were replaced with a more corporate-friendly mentality. When Warner Erhard's self-development training organization changed its name from the slightly hippie-ish sounding EST to the more professional forum in and then in 1984, and then landmark worldwide in 1991, the transformation wasn't just cosmetic. It reflected a deeper metamorphosis, not just in Earhart's organization, but in the human potential movement as a whole, of which Est had become the vanguard. In a word, it was becoming commercialized. In the 1970s, the movement had already spread from a relatively small group of West Coast Bohemians to increasingly mass-scale, mainstream, middle-class American audience. In doing so, it underwent a sort of Fritz Perl-style makeover in reverse, ditching its out-there, bushy-bearded stylings for a more buttoned-down demeanor. That included the movement's left-wing, anarchistic political proclivities, which were replaced with a focus on achieving material success within the capitalist economic system. On one level, the shift represented a total reversal of the movement's political orientation. But on another, it was a natural evolution of the movement's individualistic outlook on life. In adopting that outlook, many Bohemians had retained their radical political views, but the emphasis of their political thought had dramatically shifted away from that of their socialist and anarchistic, anarchistic predecessors. Rather than aspiring to achieve a form of collective happiness based on communal solidarity, the Bohemians became fixated on a more self-centered pursuit of happiness. However, such a pursuit of happiness is more in line with capitalism than socialism or anarchism. After all, capitalism encourages people to pursue their interests, whereas socialism and anarchism urge them to help each other through sharing resources practicing mutual aid. As the individualistic, self-seeking tendencies of the human potential movement came to the fore, its ideas and training programs increasingly caught the eyes of corporate leaders during the 1980s and 1990s. By 1987, dozens of major U.S. corporations such as Ford, Procter & Gamble, and Polaroid had spent millions of dollars sending their employees to workshops hosted by Earhart's Forum and other self-development training organizations. By the early 1990s, even the Esalen Institute had gone from being epicenter of the Californian counterculture movement to holding corporate retreats. But, as we'll see in the next blink, the commercialization of the human potential movement was a two-way street, leading both the corporate world and that movement to transform themselves into each other's images. In the late 1970s and 1980s, the ideas of the human potential movement were integrated into corporate culture. Beginning in the 1970s, American corporations faced a problem. Employees' average working hours were increasing, while their wages remained stagnant. That was great for the corporation's bottom lines, but it made their workers unhappy. On top of that, the younger members of the workforce had come of age during the heyday of the American countercultural movements. They'd been steeped in that area's unconventional ideas, many of which derived from the human potential movement and the radical political activists of the time. As a result, they tended to value authenticity, personal freedom, and notions of revolution. They were suspicious of corporations, which seemed to embody the opposite values, phoniness, bureaucracy, and the status quo. Faced with an increasingly disgruntled force, the corporation choose one of two basic paths. The first was to give their employees better wages and working conditions. The second was to try to co-opt them by giving them, or at least them, the freedom, authenticity, and innovativeness they were craving. Needless to say, the corporations opted for the second option. Words like autonomy and empowerment 
began to be tossed around in the corporate boardrooms and yet annual reports of the late 1970s and early 1980s. The language of the human potential movement started seeping into companies' internal and external communications. For example, Levi Strauss declared itself to be a company of creative individuals who are able to tap their fullest potential. And Microsoft proclaimed its mission to people and businesses throughout the world to realize their full potential. Fast forward to today, and the emphasis on self-actualization is a matter of catchphrases in many workplaces. It's become an integral part of corporate culture. For instance, consider Zappos, the online shoe and clothing retailer. From day to day, its offices are filled with an ever-shifting array of quirky objects and activities, such as coffee makers dressed as robots, employees dressed as pirates, improvised bowling alleys, petting zoos, nap rooms, karaoke events, and hot dog get-togethers. The fusion of the happiness fantasy with corporate culture is deeply problematic and increasingly untenable. One of the nice things about studying corporations is that you often don't have to do any guesswork to figure out their objectives. In many cases, they openly re reveal themselves in their official communications. Such is the case with Zappos which explains the rationale behind its amusement-filled workplace right on its website. Immediately after touting its embrace of individuality and fun, it explicitly states it's a... Rather than promoting work-life balance in the traditional sense, the company seeks to cultivate work-life integration. And why is that? Well, according to Zappos, it's because they like having a good time at work, not just outside of it. But there's also a less rosy interpretation of motivation behind Zappos and other corporations' quest to achieve work-life integration. By erasing the division between employees' professional lives and personal lives, companies bring the joys of home into the workplace. They also bring the labor of the workplace into the home in vacations, evenings, weekends, social gatherings, and so forth. Consequently, people's work and leisure time are beginning to collapse into a continuum of lasting non-stop. Indeed, the problem has become so acute that some people even report solving work-related problems in their sleep. 38% of remote workers say they check their emails at least once in the middle of the night. As work life and personal life become fused together, happiness fantasies exhortation to actualize our potential takes on a contradictory twofold meaning. On the one hand, we're supposed to march to the beat of our own drums, following our interests, pursuing our desires, developing our personal abilities, and so forth. Otherwise, we're not being authentic, pleasure-seeking, or self-actualizing. On the other hand, we're supposed to march to the beat of the market's drum, acquiring the skills, pedigrees, competitive edges, and personal brands that will make us stand out to potential employers and allow us to comport to the demands of the job market. Otherwise, we won't find employment, let alone success with which self-actualization and happiness have been created ever since the rise of Warner Earhart and the commercialization of the human potential movement. In today's increasingly unstable and competitive job market, the contradictions between these two aspects of self-actualization are becoming increasingly untenable. It's difficult to think that we're pursuing a joyful quest for self-actualization when we're really just scrambling to secure a job. Thus, the happiness fantasy is revealing itself to be bad, a fantasy. Final summary in this book. The happiness fantasy revolves around ideas of self-actualization authenticity, and pleasure-seeking that arose from the work and thought of Wilhelm or Reich in the 1920s, were developed by the human potential movement in the 1960s and 1970s, and were commercialized by that same movement in the 1980s and 1990s. In becoming popularized and, commercial in becoming popularized and commercialized, their problematic, contradictory nature has become apparent, rendering the happiness fantasy increasingly untenable. Actionable advice about alternatives to the happiness fantasy. One such alternative was hinted at in these blinks. The socialist and anarchist vision of society, 
in which collective happiness is achieved through the practice of communal solidarity, resource sharing, and mutual aid. If that, if that vision appeals to you, can you work out some of the details of how it could be pursued? If it doesn't appeal to you, can you think of another alternative? What to read next? Happiness by Darren M. McMahon. You've just seen how one of the primary threads of Western thought about happiness originated, developed, and changed from the 1920s to the present. Of course, that period of time is just the tip of the iceberg of human history as a whole. Humanity's ideas about happiness have evolved continually for thousands of years. They've grown in many directions, many places, and many eras, from ancient Greece to the Middle Ages all the way to modern times. If you're interested in exploring these chapters of the history of ideas, Darren M. McMahon is ready to take you on an exhilarating tour. So hop on board and take a ride through the history of happiness from 2006.